Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for coming out on this, uh, well, hopefully not rainy night, but I hope it settles down out there a little bit. And anyway, tonight we're going to talk about a uh, plant that's uh, maybe 50 miles south of here, near Cincinnati, and uh, was a, a normal uranium processing plant. And uh, so for that, we have uh, the site manager, the manager for uh, not only for Null, but Mound now. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> At least you got one friend in the audience. <laughs> Cheerleader. Okay, so, and, and she's a graduate of Miami U, so she's a pretty local girl. So, uh, please welcome uh, Sue Smiley. Sue? background on me. I started working at Mound in 1990 in the DOE office here and I was the environmental compliance manager for a few years and then my boss George Gartrell went to Fernald and asked me to come with him so I did. And I worked at Fernald for two years at the very beginning of the design of the cleanup and then I came back here to Mound and have worked there for several more years supporting Mound, Ashtabula, Columbus, other sites in, you know, in addition to Mound. Um, past 11 years I've worked at the EM, the department, I'm sorry, the DOE Office of Environmental Management Consolidated Business Center, which is in downtown Cincinnati. So for the past 11 years I've been providing business support service. So I'm pleased as punch that now I work for the department, uh, the Office of Legacy Management, and so I'm back at the sites and I'm the site manager. I am, my office is at Fernald, but I'm also responsible for Mound, and then there's an old uh, reactor site in Piqua that I'm responsible for. A um, little background on this presentation, I was kind of asked to speak to Fernald stories uh, more towards the production era, so what I did was uh, find a lot of old photos in the archives I thought would be very interesting, so I'm going to be up here kind of reading from uh, cheat sheets because you're mostly going to be seeing photos, not slides with a bunch of text on it. Um, one thing on the Department of uh, Office of Legacy Management, I did want to say, if you're not familiar with it, we're currently managing 91 sites, including a site in Alaska, a site in Puerto Rico, and we're going to get about 30 more in the next 10 years. So it's an organization that is spread out all over the United States. I am in a federal office of one at Fernal. Okay, so we're going to kind of start at the time uh, when the Cold War began. This just happens to be a photo of the Rosenbergs, who were American citizens but were uh, uh, Soviet spies. The photo on the right is the, the first atomic test, that's the Trinity test, that happened in 1945. Wanted to show you where the Fernald site is. It's actually about 35 miles from here. The closest town is Hamilton but the Fernald site is just out in the boondocks. True, a little, a little uh, development has happened, but not much. Uh, there were over 60 sites that were considered for this uh, uranium uh, ore refinery plant, and Fernald ended up being the one selected. So these are just some photos. The photo on the left is actually a, a whistle stop uh, train station called Fernald, and there really was no town of Fernald. There was just that train, uh, train depot and a few houses in the area. And on the right is uh, uh, one of the families that was displaced, the Nolmans, and they are actually still located right beside Fernald and still do active farming. Uh, I know this is very hard to see, but this is a front page article in a 1951 edition of the Cincinnati Times where the Atomic Energy Commission announced that it was going to build a $30 million uh, uranium ore refining plant near Fernald. <laughs> and the reasons why, it, now the article didn't say this, but why the AEC picked Fernald was it was, it was inland, it had a plentiful water supply, cost of living was very low, uh, very level terrain, there were a lot of machinists, that kind of skilled labor in the local area, and there was a rail line right beside the site, so it had a lot of good things going for it. Interesting that within one year of the dollar amount being announced on what it would take to build the site, it had doubled to 60 million. And uh, by 1953, so that's two years later, it had gone to over 100 million. 
most, um, very similar to Mound, the properties were um, procured through the process of eminent domain. Most of the properties um, you know, were sold and the people left. This happens to be an example of uh, people who had the wherewithal to actually move their house across the street. And to my knowledge, AEC did not pay for that. They did it on their own dime. Another bonus I saw, uh, it, it was kind of like a bonus for the site, was that there were no cemeteries and no schools that needed to be relocated. And it was a total of about 1,050 acres, 220 of which were set aside for production, and the rest was um, just meant to be a buffer area. Here's a couple more pictures. Again, that's the Nolman family on the left. They raised chickens. They sold eggs to Fernald employees. They had a herd of cattle, and we did have to check the milk of those cows for uranium against a a uh, herd that was a few miles to the northwest of the side just to make sure it was safe to drink, and it was. There were a total of 12 plots of lambs owned by 11 families, and they were given 30 days to vacate. Some references say 60. Um, those who did not want to vacate, did not wish to sell, were given a declaration of taking, which forced them to sell anyway. Um, the, the, the name of the plant was the Feed Materials Production Center because the products that were produced there were used for feed materials for nuclear reactors. So that would be fuel cores and billets. Um, there was cattle grazing out front. There was a water tower with red and white checks on it. And so local folklore is that it was actually a, a plant that was producing like animal feeds. Like that looks like a, a Purina plant there. Um, the site does sit on top of the one million acre aquifer, the Great Miami Aquifer, so that later ended up being a bit of a problem with some of the contamination. This next slide is interesting. The, the company that operated during the production area is the National Lead Company of Ohio, and that's the company that had the Dutch Boy paints, and so that was their logo. And there was an old publication an NL, NLO publication that said, I am now a partner with Uncle Sam in two of his important projects, producing two vital metals, uranium and nickel. Uranium is used in atomic weapons, which could soon become the source of power for transportation for factories and homes. Uh, Westinghouse followed uh, NLO in approximately 1986 when they were done with production. This next site is just an example of one of the, the properties that have been taken by eminent domain and they had to get up and running so quickly they turned this Turner house into the temporary AEC office. When the AEC was originally, that's the Department of Energy forerunner, when they were conceived it was at a time where it was thought that atomic energy could and would be put to peacetime use. Um, but we ended up becoming more of a group whose role was to be the manager of you know, atomic energy for military uses. Now, um, some of the material that I got of here is actually out of a book called Atomic Shield that was written by Floyd Herkweck. You might recognize that name in 1972. So this, uh, the emission, the production era ran from 1951 to 1980, and we basically, uh, from all basically converted the uranium ore into high purity uh, uranium metals through, there were kind of two sides of the plant, uh, a metal processing side and a chemical processing side. And it was $70 million uh, annual production budget. Uh, about three pounds of waste was generated for every one pound of product. And of course, that later proved to be a problem for the cleanup. Now, this is just a general construction picture. I just think it's interesting because it looks like a big mess. That is not demolition, that is construction. Um, not in the photo is the first plant is actually called the pilot plant, and that's because everything was done in a bench scale manner that would mimic what the, the other future plants that would be produced would be able to um, do. And it was a very successful pilot plant. Nine additional plants were built between 1951 and 1954. So it took them five months to get the first plant up and running. That's pretty amazing. Hiring began immediately. It, the facility was designed for about 1,200 employees. Of course, it was fenced just like Mound. 
Um, employees were not allowed to talk about the work they did or even uh, what the different, uh, you were assigned to one plant to work in. Well, there were 10 plants and you weren't supposed to talk about what each other's plants did. People were also told, do not call it the atomic plant. Uh, and these are just photos from this, uh, this, uh, this construction of the Berlin Wall. You've got Castro there, Russian missiles, missiles, and Kennedy and Khrushchev found an interesting quote. Um, well, by about 1962, to put it in perspective, there were over 3,000 people working around the clock at Kurnal. Now, I know you had over 2,500 here. I'm not sure if it was 24-7. I don't know. Okay. Uh, at JFK's 1961 ina inaugural address, we shall pay any price, bear any burden to assure the survival and the success of liberty. And then in 1956, Khrushchev told the Western diplomats, history is on our side, we will bury you. So it's an interesting time. Now, unfortunately, I cannot make this thing move. You might, uh, some of you might remember this was about 1956. There was a public service. It was like a little cartoon on the duck and cover process. Uh, I don't know if it was on TV or if it was just like shown in schools. It, at the Fernald site in the visitor center, we have a little area set up as if it were the 1950s with furniture and everything, and an old TV, and this thing runs on a constant loop, and people just love it. And I know you can't, this is a very busy map. The reason why I put it in there is that the Fernald site was, con it was connected with a lot of other sites in the nuclear weapons complex. Um, so stuff went kind of back and forth. I didn't find any evidence where a product from Fernald, Fernald came to mound or vice versa, but of course now it was an important part of the, of the nuclear complex. Fernald did produce over 65% of all uranium produced by the United States. Now I'm just going to show a few pictures of some of the plants. Uh, there was a coal-fired boiler plant at the site. Um, similar to a lot of other AE sites, it had its own power supply, water supply, and wastewater handling sewage treatment. Now what you see in the foreground are steel drums that needed to be reconditioning, which would be like hammer out dents, repaint them so that they could be reused for on-site use of movement of stuff. Anything that left the site always went out in a brand new drum. The drums that could not be used were thrown in this thing called Drum Mountain. Um, <laughs> now, what I couldn't find evidence of was if these things had already been taken away when the EM mission started. I don't, when I started there, there was no Drum Mountain. There were 2,000 brand new drums sitting on a pad, but that's, I don't know how old that photo is. Uh, this is the sampling plant where any incoming material was weighed, samples ground up, classified, and uh, then drummed and transported to plants two and three, which were the ore refinery plants. Um, the, the ore included pitch blend, ore from the Belgian Congo, and later on, Bernal extracted uranium from scrap metal or recycled material like floor sweepings. In, uh, to uh, just to recycle the material. This next photo is an, uh, inside of the refinery plant. Uh, the refinement process is basically taking uranium trioxide through digestion, extraction, and denitration. And this is a denitration tank. That's nitric acid in there. Uh, let me see. And so the product of this plant was shipped to the gaseous diffusion plant in Paducah for it was transplanted, uh, transported to plant four, which was another plant on site called the green salt plant. These are interior photos of, of the green salt plant. So that gentleman is, handle, is handling the uranium tetrafluoride. They were uh, packaged in 10 gallon cans. And they were, the other pictures, they were transported to uh, other, other plants on site in these things called tea hoppers. Plant five, metals production. Uh, that, pic that picture is uh, about 1963, and this guy's placing uranium metal derbies into a, a rotoblast cleaning cabinet. Uh, the other guy is weighing derbies. And, um, Derby is just a, a, a melted mass of uranium, and they call it a derby because it looks like the top of a man's derby hat, but it's about 
that tall and about that wide, and it weighs 370 pounds. Uh, some of the derbies were shipped to other DOA sites, but the majority were simply remelted. Re, I'm sorry, remelted and reformed into ingots, and then they were cut and machined to create the final products, which were the feed materials. The uh, fuel cores. This is a sample of what a fuel core would look like. It happens to be made of um, aluminum <laughs> and billets. Those were the two products that were all produced. Uh, this is another picture of the metal production plant. This just happens to be an ingot sawing operation. Ingots are, um, they can come in any size and any shape. I tried to look up the definition of it, and so I can't show you a picture of what a normal one would look like, but they're, they're big. Uh, after the derbies are melted to, to form these ingots, impurities were at the top, and so they had to do what was called top crop the ingots and that I believe is what you're seeing in this picture. We sent the cropped ingots to the RMI facility in Ashtabula, Ohio. That was a privately owned site but they did work for the AEC and that's where they were extruded. They came back to the Fernald site for uh, final machining and produced the uh, target element cores or the fuel cores for Savannah River, uh, reactors at Savannah River. Uh, there were scales everywhere. I don't know what kind of scale this is, but none of them could leave the site when production ended because they were so contaminated. Plant six is the metal fabrication plant. Uh, there were th three things that happened to that plant. They heat treated the uranium to improve its strength. They did final machining and inspection of the target element cores, and they did the top crops and inspection, final inspection before anything was shipped off site. This next photo, this the big packages there on the right are, are, are ready to be shipped out. Um, next one. An example of where they went to, this happens to be the B reactor at Hanford, Washington, where I was at just a couple of months ago. Um, I, I think you guys are aware that about four years ago, there was a Manhattan Project National Historical Park was announced, and it's a partnership between the Department of Energy and the Department of Interior, and there are, going, there are three sites for that park. One of them is the B Reactor in Hanford. That is a phenomenal visitor center if you ever had the chance to go through it. And three site, uh, the other sites are at Oak Ridge and Los Alamos. So, well, you think you can do it? So, like, these holes are where all those fuel cores got slid into. Oh, this is where I am. I'm too far. I apologize. Okay, the special products plant uh, that was named because it could simply handle larger pieces of uranium metal than the, than the other plants. Again, in these photos, we're seeing a top crop. Uh, there on the left in the photo on the right, the guy is doing a center boring of the uranium metal. Okay, here's where the definition of ingot. Piece of relatively pure metal, pure material, usually metal, cast into a shape suitable for further processing. That's why I couldn't find you a picture. This is the analytical laboratory. Uh, in 1955, there were about 113 people who worked in the lab. It was staffed 24 hours a day, um, all the way through you know, the end of 1950. This is an interesting photo. I talked to some people who had worked at Fernald during the production era. We think this is a large chunk of graphite that was cut into slices. Uh, that was used to either line or possibly form the crucibles in which the uranium metal ingots were cast. And the reason why graphite was used because it could withstand um, the hot metal without melting. So if any of you know what this picture might be, let me know. A um, lot of air quality monitoring. I don't really have the specifics on what they're specifically looking for, or what plant that was in, but continuous air monitoring all of the plants. Similar, uh, similar to Mound, they had a um, fire department, uh, ambulance crew. Now that was 24/7 because the operations were happening 24/7, and 
if the ship didn't happen to show up, the current ship couldn't, couldn't leave. Also had an armed guard force, just like we had here. Uh, uh, a company laundry that happened to be in the same building as the uh, cafeteria. Uh, employees changed from, had to change clothes at least twice a day, depending on whether you were coming from the hot side to the cold side or vice versa. The showers could accommodate 145 employees at the same time. A lot of social activities during the production era. This happens to be a photo of the Beagle Club competition champions. And we have some people who are kind enough to donate things like old trophies or photos like this. They are on display at the visitor center. Uh, there was an annual family picnic. If you've ever been down there, there's a place called Stricker's Grove, which is a um, a roller coaster surrounded by cornfields. It's kind of hilarious looking, but it's a wonderful little privately owned park, and that's where picnics and things were. And of course, they had baseball and the lovely ladies on the golf team. Um, another thing, I don't have a picture of it, they also had a shooting range at Fernald that could be used by both guards and employees, I guess, to practice. Well, of course, that resulted in the same problem we had here at Mound, that's lead contamination, so we had to clean up, clean up the lead. So over 5 million pounds of uranium metal were produced by Fernald. Uh, like I said, they went to Hanford and Savannah River. Uh, during the 80s, they also, uh, products were generated using depleted uranium for shielding of the Abrams tank. I'm not really familiar with that kind of tank, but... Okay, so in the 1980s, that's when things changed. That's when the public first learned that soil and water at and near the property had been contaminated by uranium and other hazardous substances. This is a neat photo because it does show what the Office of Environmental Management inherited. Those are thousands of drums, some in better shapes than others. Some had very highly corrosive contents. Um, it was a mess. This is a Time Magazine cover in uh, October 19, 1988, and basically we became the poster childs for environmental outrage. Uh, at one time, I have a whole list of things here, publications. The, the Fernald site was averaging more than one article a day in various national and local publications. There was a political cartoon, Mr. Red with two heads. I could not find an image, but when I Google Mr. Red, it's the Cincinnati Red baseball guy with the baseball head, so I'm not sure if it's the same Mr. Red. This is, um, so production ceased in 1989, which was I think about the same time it stopped here, and it came to just a sudden halt. Now this picture happens to be in the <coughs> mid 80s. I like it because it shows how full and how large that parking lot was. So this was when, the, the photo was when production was still going on. Okay, so now we're in the phase where the site was being cleaned up. It um, was, was the first DOE site to be put on the Superfund list, uh, which is the CERCLA law established Superfund. Mound was subsequently put on Superfund. Kind of a neat difference between the two sites. Bernal was put on Superfund because of uranium contamination. Mound was put on because of volatile organic compounds, solvents contamination that messed up soil and groundwater. So part of what you do under the CERCLA process is you do these remedial investigations and feasibility studies to figure out what contaminants are out there, where are they, and, and what are potential viable options for remediating, remediating, that, remediating those contaminants. And that took about 10 years to get through that process at Bernal. They ended up grouping um, the over 1,000 acres into five operable units. Uh, community involvement was was very, very intense in the early 1990s. These are just some photos of various um, various groups. There was a, a citizen's task force. I believe we had one here at Mound 2. Is that correct? Was there a citizen's task force? CTI? Mound Reuse Committee. Okay. Probably about the same thing. Um, there was Fernald Residents for Environment, Safety, and Health, or FRESH, and that kind of spawned the MESH group here at Mound. 
what we did through the community involvement process, though, we finally got their buy-in that um, uh, 80 percent of the waste that was kind of a low-level radioactivity could stay on site, and 20 percent of the higher, the hotter stuff would go off-site. Uh, okay, this, this lists some more of the stakeholder groups. Of course, the stakeholders include both the U.S. and Ohio EPA. Um, the second bullet there is kind of similar to what happened at Mound. There was a worker transition where the Department of Energy provided X amount of dollars to help people, help them, you know, find jobs in the future, to help them to learn how to write a resume or pursue a degree. And that's what that was referring to. And the last bullet, again, I believe you have that here at Mound. There's a medical monitoring program for the former employees. So getting back to the operable units, let me see what happens. Oh, this is just kind of showing the five OUs that I told you about. Um, waste pits, other waste units is kind of where they, that was the catch-all where they threw anything that wasn't radioactive. Uh, operable unit three is the production area. Operable unit four um, is really all of the silos. There were four silos, two of them are called K65. And then the operable unit five is just a generic thing called environmental media, which is all soil, all groundwater. Uh, this is a photo from 1998. And let me see, the, the cost of the cleanup, I'm just throwing some statistics out, was $4.4 billion. That was a lot more than Mound. Mound was about $1.1 billion. Um, you can see, though, that during the cleanup mission, the parking lot is just as full as it was during the production era. And up in the upper, let's see, that's not the pointer, not, sorry. Up here, all along here is where the on-site disposal facility would eventually be built. What you're seeing here are the first cells they started at this end, and when they were finally done with cleanup, there ended up, ended up being eight cells, and that's where the low level radioactively contaminated soil and uh, construction rubble was placed. So operable unit one, just a little history on the waste pits. Um, these pits ranged in the size from a baseball diamond to a football field. They varied in depth from 13 feet to 30 feet. And they contain nearly a million tons of low-level radioactive waste byproducts of uranium and thorium processing. That was, took about $450 million to complete just the waste pit, waste pit remediation alone. This picture is really all OUs combined that we had three locomotives on site. There were 60 rail, rail cars that would make up what we called a unit train. And there were, so there were 100, 154 unit trains that went out. And we had a fully functional rail spur that of course ended up later being demolished at the end of cleanup. Operable unit two was uh, this is kind of what I call a catch-all. Uh, the fly ash that came from boiler plant, lime sludge from uh, the potable water treatment plant, and just sanitary waste and some laboratory waste was placed in these other other waste site. Uh, cleanup to the cleanup cost for this this operable unit was about 34 million. Operable unit three was the production area, so everywhere that there were buildings. What happened was the announcement to shut down the plant, everything was just mothballed. So things, uh, there were products in various forms of they weren't done yet. There was stuff held up in process lines. There was equipment that was left contaminated. And that ended up complicating the, the future cleanup, cleanup job. The total cost to clean up the operable unit three was about $577 million. And I have some neat photos of, of that. This was one of, this plant was the tallest plant. It was seven stories tall. Interesting fact, the um, original steel work was all done by Native Americans because they were steel workers and they weren't afraid to get out there and walk around at that height. So there's a lot of neat stories. 
Um, I was there when they tried to implode this plant. It was meant to be a pilot of, of using implosion on others, and it failed. Uh, all the bomb, not bombs, it, it, when it boom, 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 it sank one floor and then tilted and stopped. So that was very, very unsafe configuration to be left in. And we had to do a lot more planning to get it the rest of the way down. Uh, they did that, the second implosion at night. The first one was done during the daytime and we had a ton of dignitaries there. And it was very uncomfortable. <laughs> okay. Whoops, I'm pointing the wrong way. Okay, so operable unit four are the silos. There were four silos at Fernald. They were concrete structures. Uh, they were about 80 feet in diameter, about 35 feet tall. Silos one and two had radium bearing waste from uh, the Belgian Congo ore. And that actually, silos one and two were the largest single source of radon in the world. One of the things they did because the concrete started cracking was to pile up like bentonite clay around those silos to cut down you know, the dose that, you, that people might be introduced to. And they very closely um, monitor how long the guys who mowed the lawns, because they would have to mow those, those sides, they very carefully monitored how many, you know, amount of time they were out there mowing. The cost for just these two silos alone was $488 million. This is just a shot. Uh, okay, so there's silos one and two down here. The other two silos are sort of off screen. All of this infrastructure had to be built to support the remediation of the, of the three silos that contained waste. What's interesting is the um, parking lot areas and one of the kind of uh, Butler Buildings pole barn, we were able to repurpose and the visitor center at Fernald is one of the old warehouses that supported the silos project. Uh, this is just a shot of the interior where they had to use a remote controlled equipment and a pneumatic retrieval system to get the muck out of there. It was kind of a wet, a wet product. They originally tried to use vitrification, uh, which is turning, turning something into glass and then you ship the glass canisters for, for disposal. That didn't work, so they ended up having to do this technology. Okay, Silo 3 was a little different. Um, it didn't have the Belgian Congo uh, waste. It was just this powdery radioactive residue dust. I apologize, I don't know what the isotopes were. And it was a highly dispersible dust. So the way they remediated that was they vacuumed it up and treated it so it wasn't as dispersible in air, bagged it up, and shipped it to uh, Utah. That was about $100 million to complete that silo. The fourth silo was empty. So this is just a photo of the very last nuclear material shipment that left the site after the silos project was done. So there were 31 million pounds of nuclear product that had to be dispositioned as a result of this project. So some of it actually went to other DOE sites, some was sold to private sector, uh, some went to Portsmouth facility for interim storage under the DOE uranium facility management group, and some was disposed of, it was Department of Defense materials. That brings us to the last operable unit, which uh, includes both groundwater and soil. So the, four, the first four operable units, remediation is done. Operable unit five, remediation is ongoing. We are cleaning the groundwater up to safe drinking water standards, and that is primarily because of the uranium contamination. And then um, the soils, 91% of the soils on-site soils that were contaminated were placed in on-site disposal facility and only about 9% were so hot that they had to be shipped off-site. So the cost, uh, the total cost to, to uh, remediate groundwater and soil and to get it where it is today by about $320 million. This is a photo of the gigantic advanced wastewater treatment facility which is a huge version of the pump and treat facility we installed here at Mound. It was designed with a treatment capacity of 1,100 gallons per minute. That's how much was processed. 
and then it was increased later on to 2,900 gallons per minute. So now we're talking about the on-site disposal facility, which is a landfill. About 85% of the contents of that landfill are, are soil, and 15% is the demolition debris from when we tore down all those buildings. It was a $220 million project to construct it. The total length is longer than two Empire State buildings. It's massive. We inspect it quarterly. We walk over the top. We're looking for gopher holes, slumping, um, invasive species like honeysuckle. And, uh, one of the, and the, the cover is actually seeded with native prairie grass. That keeps the soil in place. But we have to burn that periodically. It's called a prescribed burn. We do it very safely, and a professional does it. But that's how you keep invasive species out. You burn it. OK. Um, in this picture, cells one and two are completed. The little inset is just a corner mo monument that you'll find at four corners of the OSDF. That's very common at all LM sites because at some site there's nothing left. So LM puts these markers in so people at least know the four corners of something that used to be there. Each of the eight cells has its own leak detection system and a leachate collection system because there might be a little residual moisture in the waste. This is just a graphic of all the layers. On the left is the cap. Um, I have a brochure I can show you that goes into a little more detail. And then you also have a liner, which is at the bottom. Uh, the drainage from the layers, it is collected, and it is sampled uh, twice per year. We're really getting no leakage. I mean, it's just dry. It is functioning wonderfully. So these articles are coming out in the 2006 time frame when the cleanup was complete. And that's when the phrase weapons to wetlands was coined. So these are happy articles instead of sad. This, let me see, this photo was taken in 2015. And so there's the OS. Whoops, I'm sorry. Go back. Wow. So here is your OSDF. You can kind of see the lines. Those are the uh, divisions between the different cells. And you can kind of see that because we uh, burn the cells at different times. And so some cells look brown and some look green. Anywhere you see water, those are just the holes that were left behind after all these buildings were taken down. And we had to scoop out all the contaminated soil beneath. So it was, it's a great way, and it's very clay soil. So, so it was a great way to set up uh, little ponds and wetlands. So we kind of worked with what we, what we had. Now, some of these acreages overlap, but that gives you and I a different kind of um, sort of ecosystems that we do have at the site. That, that's a kingfisher. There's a ton of them flying around. They hang around water all the time. And uh, you, that, those things sticking up in the bottom photo, those are actually power poles, but they are gone now. We've put our electrical service underground for the most part of the site. Uh, we, uh, we planted thousands of plant plugs where you just dig a hole and you jam this plant in it. A lot of wetland plants, sedges, wildflowers. And we, it's called inoculating a pond. We would gather muck from an existing pond, and you just go dump it in a newly formed pond, and that has all kinds of microbes in it and seeds, and that's what allows the, the uh, ecosystem to establish. And we also work hard to limit invasive and non-native plants. Uh, honeysuckle is a great example. We just spent two weeks getting rid of honeysuckle on the site. That's pretty labor-intensive work. The uh, Office of Legacy Management has a document called uh, Institutional Controls Plan. Uh, we also have institutional controls here at Mount. Examples are signage that says stay out or a deed restriction that, where, that tells a property owner you can't use groundwater. Uh, similar things are at Fernald, although uh, the property remains under DOE ownership at Fernald. Um, under aquifer rex restoration, there's just some tidbits there. There are 20 extraction wells that are pumping 24 hours a day. 
the, the metric there of the how many pounds of uranium removed, that's since we've been operating the system. We're allowed to discharge 600 pounds of uranium a year to the Great Miami River. Um, and we can't have a concentration that's any greater than 30 parts per billion, but, but we're compliant with Safe Drinking Water Act. Uh, these are just photos. Those uh, the little green buildings are the uh, leachate valve houses. There's eight of those for each cell of the OSDF. That's just an example of guys planning the, the plugs. And the white building there is the uh, wastewater treatment facility that, that remains. And we have tons of deer running around. Pretty picture. Uh, the little blue house, that's one of the extraction well houses. There's 20 of those. And the, the, the water that's being extracted is sampled once per month, and they're looking for the total uranium. There are also additional monitoring wells. I think we've got 140 of them. And that's what, like, the little orange thing sticking up there. That's the kind of well that we have here at Mound. And those are sampled maybe twice a year for uranium, plus other things like water level and other constituents like dissolved oxygen. Uh, some other examples of the ongoing work we do. We do a lot of um, erosion repair work because there's a stream that's kind of up on the northeast corner and, and uh, we don't, we, we don't want that stream bed to erode because it would be eroding onto you know the former production area. So we rebuild that sometimes. Um, we do periodic inspections of the entire site, not just the OSDF. So those are walking around. Sometimes we do find little pieces of debris and we put a little flag in the ground. We don't touch it. We have a, a, a rad tech come out and scan it and make sure that it's not contaminated. If it is, we put it in a, a bin. Uh, that bin, I mean, it's it's not even as full as this thing here. So for, the, for since 2006, we have found very little pieces of radioactive debris that, that need to be um, um, controlled and, and shipped off site. The two photos there of the burn, that's the burn we did last year. Or, no, one of them is a cell of the OSDF. I think the other one is just a general burn. But that, these are people who are certified to safely perform these burns. So of course, the local fire department is notified, but they're not the ones doing the burn. And we have a wildland fire management plan, which has all the specifics on how to control inadvertent fires or to conduct these prescribed burns. And that helps. Um, restore nutrients to the soil, it burns the non-native species, and it allows the indigenous species to get a good head start the following spring. We do the burns in the fall. And the a site is not open to the public when we do those burns. General pictures, we have tons of Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, uh, K through 12 kids come to, to the site all the time. We built a bird blind. Um, one of our biggest component of people that comes to the site are bird watchers. There are hundreds of bird watchers and they're not just from Ohio. We built this lovely blind, we put a nice bench in them, there for them to sit on and they took the bench out because they needed room for their camera tripods, which is fine, we just kind of found it amusing. Uh, if you don't know what the birds on the left are, those are pileated woodpeckers. These, these were um, this year, this spring, the bird watchers went nuts. They brought their lawn chairs and they sat down under that tree for hours and snapped pictures. And this photo was actually taken by one, one of the bird watchers. Uh, that's a viceroy butterfly. It kind of looks like a monarch, monarch. We have a ton of those. That's a least weasel. They're running all around the place. The bottom photo there is a photo that's taken by what's called a trail cam. Hunters use those. And that bobcat was the first, it was first recorded in 2012, and it was the first bobcat recorded in the state of Ohio for Butler County. So it was a big deal. The photo on the right was a, um, that was a cat that was born in 2013, and I stuck the kitten picture in for fun. I did not, that was not taken up for an all. <laughs> um, monarch butter, butterflies, we do, we just did it last weekend, we tag them, that's the little disc you see there in the center picture, it does not affect their ability to fly or safely to get to where they migrate to, which is Mexico, which is a photo in the top left. Um, and so we have volunteers that come to help us with the tagging. The 
photo on the lower left is the favorite food of the caterpillar, and the photo on the right is milkweed, which is the favorite fo food of the butterfly. So we do plant uh, uh, milkweed around the site, and we give away packets of, of milkweed if anybody would like to plant it on their property. This is a really neat thing. We uh, partnered with the uh, University of Cincinnati. Those bugs at the top are called American barium beetles. One's a male, one's a female. They're big. They're about that big. And they're a carrion beetle, and they're, they were put on the uh, endangered species list in 1989. So we've got a five-year project with the zoo. The zoo comes with, um, oh gosh, like 100 pairs of beetles that are raised in the lab. And they come with 100 dead rats. And we dig these holes, and we put the beetles in the hole, and put the dead rat on top of them, and then a little, some other little stuff on top so they don't get crushed, and then we put the original soil plug back in. Then a few months later, we set out traps to see if any babies had been born as a result of that. And we catch them in traps, and we count them. And this was the first year, this is, year, this is the fourth year, where they have actually found babies that have been born. So that's a really big deal to the zoo. But we can't call it success until we trap in the spring because if they can't find any babies that made it through the winter, you're not allowed to count it as a success story. So that's a, a really neat relationship with the zoo. Um, a lot of the programs we do are actually night programs for meteor showers, going out and looking and listening for uh, our, I'm sorry, owls. Um, coyotes. We have had over 12,000 people typically come every year to the visitor center and that also counts if someone is asked to come give a presentation at a local rotary club. They'll kind of take a head count and say well there's 20 people in this room so that does count towards the head count. We do have a little over seven miles of hiking trails. I am proud to say that I said we have to pave one of these so that someone in a wheelchair can actually enjoy some of these and we're working on getting another one paved. Um, and some of them go through forests, some are more around the wetland area. You are not allowed to walk on top of the OSDF unless you're on a special tour and we can take you up, up on top of there, but it's not a hiking trail per se. This is, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I keep, whoops, that thing there, that is the visitor center. So that is the former, uh, one of the former warehouses that was supporting the silos cleanup project. Uh, in that visitor center, uh, we have some terrific exhibits. I think some of the Mount Museum folks may have gone there, maybe get some ideas or something. Um, there's a huge community meeting room that uh, nonprofit organizations can reserve. We have garden clubs that come there. A lot of Cub Scout troops meet there every other week. A lot of educational programs that we provide there, or maybe we travel to a local school. I think last, uh, last week, I believe, we were at the Cincinnati Zoo. And so that's just an idea of the, if you were to go and see the exhibits, it ranges from production all the way through present day. Uh, this is inside and in the exhibits um, and down there at the bottom is an example of some kids that are learning about water quality and what they're doing is they're counting bugs and larvae in water and you compare them to these charts that tell you well if you find this kind of bug you have high quality water. So that, that's a lot of fun. This is a, a monument out at the very front of the site. It was put, it was paid for by the Fernald Community Alliance, which is still an active stakeholder group today. Um, the picture on the right is a Cold War uh, monument that was also paid for by the Fernald Community Alliance. And the bricks, you can purchase a brick and have them engraved. So a lot of former employees have done that. This just gives you a sense of the hours of operation. We're basically open dawn to dusk, but the visitor center itself is only open Wednesday through Saturday. And um, here are people you can contact if you have any questions. Um, that's me at the top, and then there, uh, the Navarro is the duty contractor, and uh, Penny Borgman is responsible for management of the visitor center, and it's been a great person to talk to. 
and it's the end of my presentation, but I just wanted to point out that the logo is very specific. It's obviously the head of the kingfisher bird. I showed you a photo of that earlier. Its body is a leaf because we have lots of forested areas. The little swirly thing at the bottom is water, and the uh, grasses are the native prairie grasses. That we... No. <laughs> forever. I do not know how far down it's buried in Utah. That's something I would have to research. I do not know off the top of my head. You said they tried vitrification of, of the waste and it didn't get very far with that? Right. Yeah, it failed. Unlike other sites, West Valley Demonstration Project in New York, we vitrified all the waste up there, but it, it did not work. I do not know why it failed, but it did. Any other questions? Illness rates of workers. You know, I didn't look up any, I, I, think, I think again it's similar to Mound where there are all kinds of studies done by independent groups such as the uh, Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry where they were looking to see if they could find, you know, cohorts of, of people where there was a higher prevalence of cancer. I, I don't, think they've had any for Mound. I didn't bring any background information on that. I know they have the medical monitoring program, same as they do here, where people come, in fact, once a month in the visitor center, uh, former employees would come and, and, you know, they can take advantage of services such as lung x-rays or um, uh, hearing, hearing tests. I have a book at home called The Girls of Atomic City. <coughs> Is oh, okay, yeah, I've, they, I've got, heard of they got the uranium from Belgium. Yeah, yeah, and that Belgian ore did come to the Fernald site. I in saw, New York. I saw another. Uh, yeah, back when the plant was being destroyed, there was a, I guess, a legend or a rumor that was going around that a piece of heavy machinery had to be abandoned on site and buried there. Is there any truth to that? I've not heard that legend. I know they found a truck here, didn't they, in the mound landfill? But we knew about that. I, I don't know. Yeah, I heard there was something that was being used to, to clean up the site. It broke into something, got hot, and they just had to bury it on site. But it was just, you know, there was no proof of it. I just heard it as a, heard it through several sources, though. So. And it could very well be true because when after they cleaned the, con the contamination and equipment, I mean, this, none of this stuff was something that could be reused in another site. But they would size reduce things, so there may have been something big, but it would have get chopped into smaller pieces so that you can minimize the air void space, like in the OSDF, you want as little void space in there. Yeah. When I started in 58, uh, we had a lot of conversations about Fergald. I agree there was no routine business between the two. But one thing that I was involved in, probably the early 50s, they filtered off a several drums, 20 drums maybe, of material that had protactinium. Mm -hmm. Harold Kirby, who I started working for, and a number of others from that uh, uh, obtained two grams of protactinium, which was the uh, leading amount at that time. So. Uh, I also have uh, followed the, uh, uh, the Belgian Congo ores. Uh, I've always been had an interest in the K65 uh, down there. And then later on, well, some of the material byproducts went down to St. Louis, became the airport cake and I was involved then when that was moved to Colorado and processed. Oh, okay, Rocky Flats. Yeah, mm -hmm. and we actually got a concentrate from, from Colorado that had, uh, I think, 75 grams of uh, productinium. We 
developed a pilot plant, but we didn't get beyond that. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. I didn't know that. Thank you. Was there another question? Yeah. Did they realize all that? You ready to pitch? No. No. I don't think they did. No. No. When they built the plant, did they realize it was on top of an aquifer? I don't, you know, I, I would think they would because part of the criteria for picking it was plentiful water supply. And they, and just like all the other AEC plants, they generated their own potable water and processed water, so they had to get it from somewhere. And it's close to the river, but not very close. No, not close. <laughs> yeah. So soon the uh, waste pits were designed to have a depth that was one foot above the aquifer. What, when they put, they, uh, they put one foot above the aquifer, then they put a clay, uh, clay uh, lens in there with uh, waste wood was piled in above that. Yeah. So yeah, they knew the aquifer. Water level here in this part of the state, isn't it like only 30 feet and you're at the aquifer? It's not very far down. Yeah. Okay, thanks. I didn't know that, Doug. Yeah. Were, were there some other small sites involved as part of Fernal, like one in Hamilton of the uh, Harry Hall Marvin Safe Plan, and also a small mushroom shop in Oxford? Were there some others as well that supported Fernal? Oh gosh, I remember a reference to Oxford, Ohio, there but was, I can't remember what the reference was. I apologize. There was a small machine shop there. The fellow lived right next door to it, and they found contamination in the house that was still there. Oh really? Yeah. That was I know what you're talking about now, but I don't. I don't know what the tie was to Fernal, but I know exactly what you're talking about. And I think also the safe plant in Hamilton was involved in early machining operations. That was just cleaned up recently before the place was demolished. Okay. I just didn't know if you knew of any other places besides those two. No, no. One of the challenges I had pulling this together for you guys, um, all of the canned presentations that existed for Fernal were focused on cleanup in today's mission. So here I am trying to pull a presentation together on production era, and I could find lots of photos, but to find the people who still worked there that I could take a photo and say, what is this a picture of? It, it required a lot of effort and it was a lot of fun to pull to pull together. Well, like you said, people weren't supposed to talk about it back then. Right, right. Those of us that worked at Mound have learned more from these museum presentations than we ever learned when we were working here because we couldn't talk to each other. Yeah, I, I encourage y'all to take the time. It's really only a 35 mile drive from here to get to Fernal. And the visitor center, if you don't want to hike a trail, that's fine. You could easily spend two hours just walking through the visitor center. There's a lot of touch screen stuff, things you can touch, and it's really interesting. And that focus is almost entirely on production era and a little bit on cleanup. <laughs>